الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى Today we're going to have our last lesson on usul al-fiqh. And what we're going to speak about, inshallah ta'ala, is two things, bi-idhnillah al-kareem. The two things that we're going to talk about is fa'idah uh, to usul al-fiqh. The benefits of studying usul al-fiqh. Why is it beneficial in studying usul al-fiqh? What benefits are in studying usul al-fiqh? On the board, you have 10. On the board, you have 10 benefits that are in studying usul al-fiqh. That when you study it, you will attain, inshallah ta'ala, from it. After we cover that, inshallah ta'ala, those 10, we will go through tartibu dirasati ulm usul al-fiqh. A sequence, a gradual way. We're going to go through the sequence and a gradual way in which a person can study usul al-fiqh. If I now want to study usul al-fiqh, what is the sequence and the order in which I need to take? So I'll mention, I'll mention it in two ways. Ala tariqat al-ahnaf. The way by the ahnaf, which is also known as ala tariqat al-mutakallimin, right? I'll mention the books that are done in the Hanafi way. And we already know what the Hanafi way is. We already spoke about it. And then I'm going to mention ala tariqatil jumhur. In the way of the overwhelming majority of scholars. And we mean by that the three imams. Madhab al-Malikiyya and al-Shafi'iyya and the Hanabila. This is the books that are inshallah ta'ala going to be prescribed for them as well. <laughs> So let's start with Ibnilah al kareem with fa'ida to usul al fiqh. What benefit do I attain if I study usul al fiqh? What benefit do I get? What benefit do I get? Number one, the benefit you get is dabtu usul al istilal. Precision. You have precision in knowing what is evidence and what is not evidence. This subject. It teaches you what is an evidence and what is an evidence. Usul al-istidlal is means the f- thing that you can use as evidence. What are you allowed to use as an evidence and what can't you use as an evidence? In other words, in simple terms, what are the evidence that are agreed upon and what are the evidences which are differed upon? You'll study in this subject. And so when you learn the evidences that are agreed upon, you would know to use that first. And within those evidences which are agreed upon, you will learn which one comes first and in what order they come in. So you won't be using qiyas, which is, of course, allowed when you can go for what? A ayah min al a verse from the Quran or a hadith from the Sunnah, or you could use the ijma'. You won't go to qiyas because you know the order. Then the Quran comes first, and then the Sunnah comes second, and then the Ijma' comes. Sorry, the Ijma' comes third, and then the Qiyas comes fourth. So you, you know the order. That's the first benefit that the person gets from it. You won't be using Ada, the customs, because that's the evidence that's different upon. Ada is a difference of opinion whether that's an evidence or not. Are we all together? Um, the view of the people of Medina That's an evidence that's not agreed upon by everyone Many evidences the scholars they agree, differ on Whether it's evidence The only ones that are agreed upon is Al-Kitab wa sunnah wa al-Ijma'u wa al-Qiyas sahih So by studying usul al-Fiqh The first benefit that you get from it is You will know what is evidence that is correct And it's permitted for you to use and what isn't? 
Second is إِضَاحُ الْوَجْهِ الصَّحِيحِ لِلْإِسْتِدْلَالِ The second is you learn how to use that evidence. What is the correct way in utilizing this evidence? I have a hadith in front of me. I have an ayah in front of me. How do I use it? How do I utilize it? The person will learn the way to extract and deduct. To deduct from the evidence rulings. Usul al-fiqh teaches you that. It teaches you the relationship between the evidence and the thing that you're using the evidence for. You want to place a ruling on this. And the evidence is here. It will teach you how to bring out what you would need to give a ruling on this particular thing. It gives you that ability. Usul al-fiqh. إِضَاحُ الْوَجْهِ الصَّحِيحَ لِلْإِسْتِدْلَالِ Number three. The third benefit that a person will attain that a person will attain is تَيْسِيرُ عَمَلِيَّةِ الْإِجْتِهَادِ أصول الفقه It makes it easy for a person to become a mujtahid. It makes it easy for a person to become a what? A mujtahid. What did we say a mujtahid is? It's a person who can do independent reasoning. He can go to the Qur'an and the Sunnah himself. Or she can go to the Qur'an and the Sunnah herself. And extract and deduct rulings from it herself. If you study Usul al-Fiqh, you're heading towards that path of becoming a mujtahid. But if you're only studying Furu' al-Fiqiyah, if you're only studying Fiqh, just Fiqh, then you are not going to go to that path of ijtihad. You're just going to be the Sheikh said, the book said that this is permissible, and the book said that this is not permissible. You'll always be, as the poet said, إِذَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي فَصَدِّقُوهَا فَإِنَّ الْقَوْلَ مَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي If حَذَامِي says something, then believe her. فَإِنَّ الْقَوْلَ The real, the speech is مَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي What حَذَامِي said. Are we all together? That's what you're going to be. You're just going to be like it was said by the Sheikh. خلاص. It's what it said by the Sheikh. And it is the reality of why taqlid, blind following, increases. The reason why blind following increases is the deduction and the reducing of study of usul al-fiqh. Are we all together? Number four, bayanu dawabid al-fatwa. The person will learn the principles of giving verdicts. In usul al-fiqh, you learn the principles of how to give fatwa and how fatwa is given. Basically, you will learn adabul mufti wal mustafti, the etiquettes and the manners of the one who's giving fatwa and the one who's giving fatwa to. You will learn muraatul ahwal, observing the situations, and you will also look at ila ma yaulu ilayhi al amru. You'll be able to look at this verdict that I give, gave, or I'm giving. What can it lead to? What can it become in the future? All of that comes from studying usul al-fiqh. The person will learn bawabit al-fatwa. The one who doesn't study usul al-fiqh, he doesn't have the principles of fatwa. So when he gives verdicts, you see that he contradicts himself a lot. What does he do? He'll contradict himself in the fatwa. One time he's saying something here, and something similar to it. That isn't different from it. He's given a different ruling to it. Scholars will automatically identify this person doesn't know what he's talking about. How is it possible that you said this thing is permissible and something else which is very similar to it, you said it's not permissible? When they really have what? The same essence. Maybe not the same name, but the same reality revolves around both of them. And you've given two different fatwas for both of them. That shows there's idrab, contradiction in your what? in your study of usul al-fiqh. Are we all together, brothers? Whereas the other scholar is consistent. What is he consistent upon? He's consistent upon his fatwa. He gave fatwa here, something similar to it, he'll give it the same fatwa. وَمَا إِلَى ذَلِكَ Number five. The person learns مَعْرِفَةُ الْأَسْبَابِ الَّتِي أَدَّتْ إِلَى وُقُوعِ الْخِلَافِ بَيْنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ The person will learn 
what made the scholars differ in this issue? What brought about differing in this issue? You'll learn that. You will learn why the scholars differed. Why? Why? Why did they differ? Sabab. I, I can reassure you. Many people say there's a difference of opinion in this issue. But if you ask them, why? Why is there a difference of opinion? They can't tell you why. And not knowing why comes from you not studying usul al-fiqh. Are we all together, brothers? It goes back to what? It goes back to you not studying usul al-fiqh. I'll give you an example. Salatul Jum'ah and Salatul Dhuhri, right? We know both prayers, right? If Eid comes on a Friday, if Eid happens on a Friday, do you have the choice of praying Salatul Eid and Jum'ah or do you have to pray both of them? There's difference of opinion. Sahih. Some scholars, they say, if you pray Eid, you wouldn't have to pray Jum'ah. And if you pray Jum'ah, you don't have to pray the Eid. One eliminates the other. Correct? That's one view. Another group of scholars, they say, no, 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 no. You have to do both. One does not eliminate the other. As a group of scholars. I can now then say to you, there's difference of opinion on this issue. And I leave it like that. But when you study usul al-fiqh, you will learn why they differed. What was the reason that brought that difference of opinion? The reason why that difference of opinion came was, is Jum'ah a replacement of Dhuhr or not? Is Jum'ah taking the place of Dhuhr or not? It is, is it Iwadun an al-Dhuhri? Has it taken the place of the Dhuhr prayer? Am I making sense here? Based on what you say here, your answer is going to change. Am I, am I making sense here? So you, you learn why they differed, what brought about that difference. The difference is really on something before that, which then be, brought this to be difference of opinion. Does that make sense? Are we all together? By studying this subject, you will learn many things that scholars differ upon. What is the reason? Also, al fiqh benefits you that. Also, while I'm at that point, it also teaches you what is valid difference of opinion. What are a valid difference of opinion? And the difference which is not valid. It's not tolerated. It is not accepted. Which one is which? In other words, which one is khilafun sa'ig and the one that is khilafun ghayru sa'ig? The khilaf which is accepted and understood and the khilaf that isn't accepted but rather rejected. Because the poet he said, وَلَيْسَ كُلُّ, خِلَا... وليس كل خِلَافٍ جَاءَ مُعْتَبَرًا إِلَّا مَا كَانَ لَهُ حَظٌ مِنَ النَّظَرِ Not every khilaf that comes deserves to be given attention. Now, not every difference of opinion do we accept and we give it validity and we say, wow, there's difference of opinion. Not every difference. There's, a, there's, there's some differences which we give. Which one is which? Because you know what happens if you don't learn this one? You will unjustly, unjustly oppress people on a valid difference of opinion. Ramadan is about to come now, inshallah ta'ala. Salatul Taraweeh might be prayed in different numbers. Someone might think this is not khilaf sa'ir, a permitted difference of opinion. Rather it is. It's a valid difference of opinion. It's oppression on your side to regard those people who are praying 22, for example, or those who want to pray 11, or those who want to pray another, other numbers to say that they're innovators. That is an oppression on your side. And that's an indication you don't know usul al-fiqh. And you haven't studied usul al-fiqh. Are we all together, brothers? And you tend to find that. That people fall extreme in issues where there are difference of opinion. Valid difference of opinion. Where the pious predecessors differed 
and it never got in between their brotherhood. Are we all together? By studying usul fiqh, you will learn where you and that person can differ and where we can discuss it with a good atmosphere, in a good situation, with love in our hearts towards each other. Am I making sense? No? Yes? By studying usul fiqh, you will learn which one falls under which. Does that make sense? Well, that's why nowadays we see fatwas, of course, that are really, really rigid. That people just what? They make it rigid to the extent that as, as though they make it come across that there is no other view except this view, best. Are we all together, brothers? And anything other than that view or anything outside their opinion is misguidance. And that that person is a mubtada, an innovator, dalun, he's misguided, mudillun, he's misguiding others. Are we all together, brothers? But the reality, the issue is what? It's a valid, valid difference of opinion. Naam. Mm. You're right. They won't accept it as something. They won't accept it as the right opinion, but they will accept it as a a view that's out there that should be respected as a view. So this is the difference. When I say this, my view, for example, is my knees go down or my hands go down. Sorry. My hands go down before I go to the record, before my knees. That's my opinion. I believe oh, any other opinion other than that is wrong. But when I see someone pray next to me, are we all together? The way that I will discuss it with him is, have you looked at this opinion? Okay, may Allah bless you. Jazakallah. We go our separate ways. I have accepted that this opinion he holds and the opinion that I hold is subjective. It's how you look at it. There's a possibility I could be right and there's a possibility he could be right. There is that possibility there. Does that make sense? But for me right now, it comes across as that my one is right. Whereas on the other hand, if he was praying right next to me and he was wearing silk, it's a different opinion now. Are we all together? We also have another extreme, which is opinions are just made wider and wider and wider and it's made everything is a difference of opinion. Recently, I just came back from Europe. And I had a verdict by some group of brothers, they came to me and they asked me a question. They said, we've heard that it's permissible to break your fast if you have an exam that day. If you have an exam at university, you're allowed and you're permitted to break your fast. Are we all together, brothers? Are we all together, brothers? Now, that's not a valid difference of opinion. Are we all together? And it's baseless. I will tell the brothers. Whoever gives the verdict for it. Because it goes against many textual evidence. Are we all together? And the reason why this problem came in the first place is those who thought the reason why a traveler can break his fast is because of mashaka, hardship. It's a mistake to believe that. Whoever believes that a traveler, a person who's traveling to another country, the reason why he was given a rukhsa, the reason why he was allowed to break his fast was because of hardship, then you're wrong. That wasn't the reason. Are we all together, brothers? Many people believe that. Sahih. They believe that opinion. They'll say, so are you telling me, if a person has a, a car that picks him up from his apartment, right under his house, he's got a nice car, it picks him up from his house. He was sleeping, he wakes up, he goes into his, he jumps into his car, it gets, he gets driven to the airport, he doesn't go on a flight, but he has his private jet. And he goes on his private jet, and he lands in his destination, and he sleeps in his private jet. He's got another bed waiting for him over there. Can he break his fast? Can he break his fast? Has he gone through hardship? Has he gone through hardship? You see, this is the problem now. 
When you make a ruling for this based on hardship, then you spread it out for everything. And you will then say, anything hardship enters, it's permissible for you to break your fast. Am I making sense here? And that is wrong. And we'll speak about that inshallah ta'ala in the coming days. Which Oh, today, sorry. We have today, right? We have today uh, the chapter of fasting from Umdatul Ahkam. We will be speaking about these issues in great details inshallah ta'ala, in great detail. But the lack of usul al-fiqh. Lack of usul al-fiqh. Because that person who travels right now, he can break his fast. Whereas a person who's working in a what? Who's f- making bread, who's working in the furnace, who's burning, he's under heat. He can't break his fast. And he's going through hardship. Are we all together, brothers? Does that make sense? So p- keep that in mind, okay? Number six is ad-da'watu ila tiba'i dalil haythu ma kana. By studying usul al-fiqh, the benefits that you get from it is you call the people to following the evidence wherever it is. You generally find people who haven't studied usul al-fiqh believe there's no evidence in this issue because even if the evidence is there, they don't know how to use it. And so what they do is they tell people, use your logic. They result to rational observation. They use their minds. When there is textual evidence that you can use. Are we all together, brothers? They go to basically logic. When there is what? When there is text right there. And the reason why they won't go to the text is because they don't know their text. They don't know how to utilize it. Are we all together, brothers? But when you study usul al-fiqh, you see that person generally calls the people to follow the dalil. Because what he saw in the evidence is profound. It's amazing. He's like, wow, we've got everything answered here. Because the evidence, he knows what to do with it. And he knows how it works in every situation. Are we all together? A da'wah. By studying usul al-fiqh, you will learn and it will call you to. Ittiba'i al-dalil, haythu ma kana, wherever you are. Usul al-fiqh too calls you to that. Follow the evidence wherever it is. Are we all together, brothers? Number seven. حفظ العقيدة الإسلامية عقيدة is protected عقيدة is what? عقيدة is protected through أصول الفقه if you look at the the attacks that are happening to Islam today and you observe it and you look at it it is going back to studying أصول الفقه people are playing with the text he just comes and he uses the verse how he wants. I gave you an example the other day. The Khawarij, what did they do? They killed Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab's wife who was pregnant. They killed her and they brought out the baby. And then what did they use as evidence? إِنَّكَ إِن تَذَرْهُمْ يُضِلُّ عِبَادَكَ وَلَا يَلِدُ إِلَّا فَاجِرًا كَفَارًا Oh Allah, if you let them live, Nabi Allah Nuhu's dua, Rabbi la tadar ala al ardi min al kafirina dayara, in naka in tadarum yulilu ibada kawala yeli du illa fajiran kafara. Oh Allah, if you let these people live, Nabi Allah Nuhu after 950 years of da'wah, he got tired and exhausted. And he said, Oh Allah, if you let these people live, all they're going to give birth to is disbelievers, criminals. That's all they're going to give birth to. 950 years, he's tired now. These people don't want to hear anything. So don't let any of them remain, oh Allah. Destroy them all. What did they do? Destroy them wherever they are. Because they're not going to give birth except to disbelievers. They took that same verse and they used it in their way by saying, the reason why we killed this woman and we took out the baby is because she's only going to give birth to disbelievers and criminals. That's what she's going to give birth to. Aqidah gets corrupted. The Khawarij and all the other deviated groups that came, they did not know usul al-fiqh. They look at an ayah and they apply it the way they want. Another hadith that you hear, where the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he said to her that there is going to come a people, Allah is going to destroy them. 
from the beginning to the last of them. This is in Mecca. Allah is going to destroy them. From the beginning of the army and the beginning of those people to the last of them, Allah is going to destroy them. And then Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, yuqsafu bi awwalihim wa akhirihim. Will the first and the last of them be destroyed? Wafihim aswaqum. There's, there's markets in there. There are people who are not with those people, the criminals. Will they all get destroyed at the same time? The Prophet ﷺ said, يُخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخِرِهِمْ The first and the last of them will be destroyed together. And then, ثُمَّ يُبْعَثُونَ عَلَى نِيَاتِهِمْ And then Allah would resurrect them with their what? With their intentions. I mean, the one who was good will be taken to Jannah. And the one who was a criminal and he was a wrongdoer and his intention was to cause havoc, he'll also go to the hellfire. I mean, he will go to hellfire. Does that make sense? Does this hadith make sense? The Khawarij took that hadith and said, if we come to a village, we will kill everybody, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. All of them. Khalas. And what about the believers? Why are you killing everybody for? Why? Why would you do that? They said, as for the believers, Allah will resurrect them with their intentions. I will together, brothers. What happened here? Was what went wrong? What went wrong? Again, again, brothers. You guys might think it's very light, but the text, if it's not, if qa'usul al-fiqh is not studied, this is what it gives birth to. This is what this is what comes out. The scholars they responded to it. The scholars they responded to this. Ibn Munasif al-Qurtubi has a kitab in which he speaks about the issues, ahkam of jihad and rules of jihad. He mentions that it is not permissible to use the universal signs. The things in which Allah does, you the slave cannot do it. You cannot do qiyas, an analogy, from the actions of the creator in the universal things that he does for a what? An action that you can take into your hands and do it yourself. And he gives any, many other answers and many other response, uh, which I don't want to go into now. But the point is, the point is, this is what comes about. Your, the aqeed of the Muslims gets destroyed. Are we all together, brothers? And that's why many people don't want to come into Islam because they look at these verses and it's, mis- it's wrongly applied. It's wrongly used. Number eight. Siyanatul al-fiqh al-islami. Again, usul, uh, usul al-fiqh, the benefits that are in it is that you, f- you protect the fiqh as well. You don't just protect people's aqeedah, but it also protects the people's fiqh. Are we all together? It protects people's fiqh. Like, for example, a man could say, Allah said in the ayah, you know, ta'addud al-zawaj, mathalan, marrying multiple wives. Allah said, mathala, two, wa thulatha, five, wa ruba'a, four. So you can marry how many wives? Nine. Are you with me, brothers? He just uses the ayah. It's a fiqh issue. He said, Allah said, mathala, two. Ayah two, there is. وَثُلَاثَ and three وَرُبَاعَ and what? and how many wives will he have? he has nine wives now is that permissible? is that permitted? is that allowed? لَا لَا يَجُوزْ are we all together brothers? all of this can why is it not allowed? okay usul al-fiqh why is it not allowed to be counted like that? are we all together brothers? You'd have to go back to the ayah itself. Mathna wa thulath, the wow here, what does it benefit? Wa ma ila dali. It's a science. And that science protects fiqh. It's there to take care of these textual evidences. Without it, wallahi, any and everybody will do what they want. They'll bring an ayah and they will do what they want. No one can stop them. The most shocking thing comes. The eighth one. It means siyana, protecting al fiqh al islami. The fiqh, Islamic fiqh, f- Islamic jurisprudence. The fiqh that we study, it will protect it. Usul fiqh protects us- fiqh. It protects the fiqh for us, furu' al fiqhiyah. I saw a guy one time, he said something very shocking to me. He said, Qul, Qul inna ma ana basharun. Remember the ayah, right? Qul inna ma, Qul inna ma ana basharun. Allah says, Qul say Muhammad, inna ma, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرْ قُلْ سَيْتِدَ مُحَمَّدْ إِنَّمَا I am nothing else إِنَّمَا is مِنْ أَدَوَاتِ الْحَصْرِ Right? 
I am nothing except Bashar. I'm a human. I'm nothing except that a human. That's what it means. He said, brother, no, sorry. It doesn't mean that. Hey, what does it mean? Qul Sayyidina Muhammad, inna your ma. He separated those two. And he said, inna, qul Sayyidina Muhammad, verily I am not, use the word as ma as nafiya, negation. I'm not a human being like you guys. You see that, brothers? Qul Sayyidina Muhammad, inna, verily, ma I am not. Ana me, basharun a human, mithlukum like you guys. I'm not a human like you guys. So what are you? Now he wants to, now that he's cl- got that rid of, rid of that, he wants to say, okay, he's nur, or he's this, or he's that, right? That's how the Quran, Quran will be played with. That's how the Sunnah will be played with. These science, usulul fiqh, is what protects all of that. What does it do? It protects all of that. Number nine, ضبط قواعد الحوار والمناظرة. Again, by studying usul al fiqh, you see that the person, their method of having a dialogue and their method of having a what? A debate is precision. They know how to break things down easily. They know when to give and they know when to take. They know where to start from and what is more important to mention and what isn't. The person will learn precision of dialogue and debates. Usul al-fiqh teaches you that. If a person masters usul al-fiqh and he studies usul al-fiqh very well, he will learn how to discuss and he will learn how to use those principles in debating and arguing and etc. And how to discuss with people, right? You see, he's smart. Are we all together? Smart. I had a discussion with a brother one time and I said to him, brother, I'll ask you a question. He said to me, the Sahabas, they differed in Aqidah. And he left it like that. I said, that statement is wrong. It's incorrect. You shouldn't say that. You should not say that the companions differed in Aqidah. He goes, but brother, with all due, with, with all due respect, there is difference. We do see the companions had. But what's the difference you're talking about? He said to me, the difference that they had is whether Allah was seen or not. Is that not an aqidah related issue? I said, definitely you're right, it is an aqidah related issue. It is an aqidah related issue. He said to me, did they differ on that issue? I said, yeah, they did. He then said to me, you should then accept that they differed in? Aqidah said, no, I don't accept that now. I said, that's a contradiction. That's, that's not fair. I said, the reason why I don't accept that is, it's like me saying to you, the Sahabas agreed upon fiqh. Would you accept that from me? If I unrestrictedly said that the Sahabas agreed on fiqh, and I give an example of, they agreed that the salat, the salah which are part of the pillar of Islam is five. al dhuhr wal asr wal maghrib wal isha wal fajr. Are we all together? Did they not agree upon that? They agreed upon that. And I then say to you, this is a fiqh-related issue, correct or not? Yes. Then can I then conclude from that, that the Sahabas unanimously agreed upon on fiqh issues? He said to me, no, no. Are you with me, brothers? No, you can't. What you do say, though, is you restrict your statement. You restrict your statement by saying the furu issues of fiqh. Sorry, the furu issues of al-aqidah. The sub-branches of Aqidah Because Aqidah has what? Usul and it has what? Furu' It has fundamental issues And it has sub-branches They differ on some of the sub-branches in Aqidah If you say that to me I will accept that from you The same way I can say to you They differ on some furu' issues of fiqh Because even fiqh has usul issues Which they didn't differ upon And Ibn al-Qayyim mentions when somebody speaks, brothers, you should stay away from ambiguity and that which is unclear. فَعَلَيْكَ بِالتَّفْصِيلِ وَالتَّمْيِيزِ فَالْإِطْلَاقُ وَالْإِجْمَالِ دُونَ بَيَانِ قَدْ أَفْسَدَ هَذَا الْوُجُودِ وَخَبَّطَ الْأَذْهَانَ وَالْآرَاءَ كُلَّ زَمَانِ Stay away from ambiguity and that which is not clear. 
Don't say statements like the Sahabas differed upon Aqeedah. Straight away what comes to the people's mind is that anything within Aqeedah is open for difference of opinion. That is incorrect. Does that make sense? The same way if somebody else was to say that the Sahabas unanimously agreed upon fiqh, that the person would understand it as every issues of fiqh they unanimously agreed upon. Secondly, no one ever said historically, Islamically, no one unrestrictedly said that the Sahabas differed upon Aqeedah unrestrictedly like that. If that makes sense. Well, ilmu inda Allah Azza wa Jalla. Last but not least is al wuqufu ala samahati shari'at al islamiyati What you learn by studying usul al-fiqh is how simple this religion is and how easy it is. And you learn that this religion has come to serve us. This religion has come to serve us, to give us what we need, the good that we need. Here, the religion didn't come to burden us and to stress us out and to cause us harm and over... No, it didn't. Inna dina yusrun. This religion is ease and simplicity. And this religion, no one may overburdens it and makes it hard and complicated except that what? It will overcome you and it will destroy you. This religion is easy. مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah did not make burden and hardship in this religion. I want you to all remember this issue. There is a difference between did Islam bring about mashaqa? Ama, does some of the rulings have in it mashaqa? Or does it have in it usr? Those are two different issues. In the ma'al usri? In English, there's not a, a definite word I know that can be used to translate it. But the word usrun and mashaqa are two different words. I'll leave that for inshallah ta'ala when we go next lesson into the five general legal maxims. When we talk about it, talk about it there's going to be one called uh, uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said al-dararu um, yuzal al-dararu the Prophet said, but the scholars, they said, We'll speak about it in there, inshallah ta'ala. But the tenth one is, you will learn how easy this religion is. By studying usul al-fiqh, you will actually be impressed on how Allah is trying to bring about ease for us. The last point that I want to speak about is, if I want to study usul al-fiqh, what do I do? How do I do it? Inshallah ta'ala, this is going to be the shortest. If you're a Hanafi, and we spoke about the reason why they are called Tariqatul Mutakallimin. We spoke about that. There are three books, inshallah ta'ala, that they should uh, study. These three are studying. The first one is Talkhisul Usul by Hafiz Tathanaullahi Zahidi. This one they studied with the teacher. And they learn it. What I've written on the board is that which you have to study with a teacher. There has to be a teacher that teaches you. The Al Manar by Al Nasafi. The Manar by Al Nasafi. And last but not least, Kashful Al Salar Li Ala Din Al Bukhari. Those three at Hanafi should study it with a teacher. Inshallah ta'ala, in that order that I mentioned it in. In that order that I mentioned in, the student should also read a couple of books on the side. When he studies these three as a Hanafi in Qawaid al Fiqiyah, he should read the following ones that I'm going to mention, inshallah ta'ala. They should try to read it. And that is the Usul of Al Bazdawi. And the best publication is Darul Bashair. Taqweem Usul al Fiqh by Dabusi. Nashru Maktabati. Then the, the, the version and the publication of Maktabatul Rushd. Usul al Sarkhasi. Am al Sarkhasi. By the Tahqiq of al Afghani. Al Fusul fil Usul by Jassas. By the Wizaratul Awqaf al Kuwaitiya. Badl al Nadar by al Ismandi. Darul Turath. Those five that I mentioned, the student, he reads them. As a Hanafi, he reads them. 
after having studied those three with the teacher. Now we go into the ala tariqatil jumhur. If the person is not a Hanafi, he's either a Maliki or a Shafi'i or a Hanbali. To be very honest with you, I was a bit biased. So I only wrote the Shafi'i version. Here I only wrote what a Shafi'i should study. But inshallah ta'ala, I'll mention what the Hanabila should study, inshallah ta'ala. But, they get, but then again, they are all roughly the same. There are a little furuq here and there, but they are roughly the what? They're roughly the same. al waraqat the person study that starts with that one first. There's two sharahs. There's two explanations that the student should read after having studied the matin with the shaykh. Remember brothers, a lot of the students, what goes wrong is they buy an explanation and they're sitting in front of the teacher and they don't know what is the explanation and what is the matin. The matin is the words of the author. And the sharah is the explanation of a person who came after. Okay? A student, he should be concerned with the matin, the wording of the author. Don't busy yourself with the sharah now. Once you've studied this book with a teacher, okay, he brings you the quotes and the references and the explanation, and he breaks down for you what the author means here, then I would then advise you to read two sharahs. After you've understood the matin, after you've understood the words of the author, I would highly encourage you to look at the sharah of Abdullah ibn Salah al-Fawzan with the publication of Darul Minhaj. His sharah is very easy and it's full of what? Textual evidences. He gives you evidence. As you know, the author, Imam Ali al-Juwaini, doesn't give you evidence for what he says the overwhelming majority of times. He doesn't. But by getting the sharah of Abdullah ibn Salah al-Fawzan, you will get those evidences. And the second sharah, which is a bit harder, is the sharah of Jalaluddin al-Mahalli. Jalaluddin al-Mahalli. He has a sharah on, on al-waraqat. Jalaluddin al-Mahalli. Have you all heard of Jalalain? Tafsir al-Jalalain. Why is it called Jalalain? Two Jalal. Because Jalaluddin al-Mahalli and Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. Ah, he's, this, he's one of the swallows. He has a sharah on al-waraqat. Um, the student should try to, inshallah ta'ala, get that. The sharah of Jalaluddin al-Muhalli. And try to find Jalaluddin al-Muhalli sharah with the hashiyah of Dimyati. Okay? With the hashiyah of Dimyati, rahimahullah ta'ala. Don't busy yourself with the other hashiyah of Al-Jawi, rahimahullah. Al-Jawi's hashiyah is very complicated for someone of that level. So just take two explanations. The first one is Abdullah ibn Salah al-Fawzan. The best publication for that one is what? What is it? Darul Minhaj. Abdullah ibn Salah al-Fawzan sharah on al-Waraqat is Darul Minhaj. It's very good by that. Try to get that one. It's the best publication. The second one is what? The sharah of who? Jalaluddin al-Mahalli with the hashi of Dimyati. Dimyati has footnotes on it. That's very good. Try to get that inshallah ta'ala. I said to you, don't busy yourself with the hashi of al-Jawi rahimahullah. Don't busy yourself with that. Because at that time, it's a bit complicated for you. It's a bit what? It's a bit complicated. Jalaluddin al-Mahalli's publication, I haven't yet seen it. But there's a brother who I'm very close with, who is from Somalia as well. He did a tahqiq of it. Hassan Ali Dawood, he did a tahqiq on the waraqat, the sharah of Jalaluddin al-Mahalli. I haven't seen the copy. I haven't seen the copy uh, yet. But it's been praised by a group of people, inshallah ta'ala. The second one is Al-Usul min ilm al-Usul by Sheikh bin Uthaymin. Al-Usul min ilm al-Usul by Sheikh Muhammad bin Usul al-Uthaymin. And Sheikh Muhammad bin Usul al-Uthaymin's Usul min ilm al-Usul, the unique thing about it and the benefit that it has is what? The beauty and the benefits that are in it is what? Is He's different from Abi Ma'ali al-Juwaini. How is he different? He has evidences a lot. Sheikh ibn Uthaymin, he's usul min ilm usul. It's got a lot of evidence. Even if you don't get sharah for it, he gives you a lot of examples. And he gives you evidences for his arguments. And the third benefit that he has as well is 
his aqid as aqidah to Ahlul Sunnah. So he's, he's going to stay away from statements and things that have what? Creedal problems in it. So that's what I always say to the person when he does al waraqat after that, if you transit, if you transit to Sheikh ibn Uthaymin's al usul min al usul you have um, the ability to know what is, has aqidah issues and what doesn't. At this point, there's a sharah I personally think is the best sharah for al-usul min al-usul. It is one written by, I might be wrong or right in the way I say his name, but I think it's Ghazi ibn Murshid al-Utaybi. Ghazi ibn, Ghazi ibn Murshid al-Utaybi. His sharah is, the, is very good. His sharah is what? It's very good. I think that should be the, the one that you rely on. And once you've read that sharah, on the side, just read as well the sharah of Ibn Uthaymin himself. The Shaykh himself explained his book. Both of those sharahs are published by Darul Minhaj. Darul Minhaj published both of them. And right now, this current moment, um, Al Usul Min Al Usul has been released. I've done the first six parts or seven parts. The first six, seven chapters, I've done it. Of Usul Min Al Usul is on my channel. If you want to study it, I've read that Al Waraqat many times before, and for the first time, I'm recording Al Usul Min Al Usul in great details. The third book, again, now I'm coming back to Shafi'i now. I'm leaving because Usul Min Al Usul, we stepped into Hanbali world, we came back to the Shafi'i now. Al Lumma' by Fi Usul Fiqh by Abu Ishaq al Shirazi. Al Lumma' Fi Usul Fiqh by Abu Ishaq al Shirazi. Um, I think Darul Bashair published it. I think Darul Bashair, I'm a Darul Nawadir, one of the two. I think it's Darul Bashair. They have a publication on it, which is very good. They have some of the Hawashi and the Ta'liqat of Jamaluddin Al Qasimi on there as well. The point, I, the reason why I chose the Luma of Abu Ishaq al Shirazi over the Ghayatul Usul fi Lubbil Usul by Zakari al Ansari is because Abu Ishaq al Shirazi, his book, it doesn't have big creedal problems. And Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah praised it greatly. Abu Shaq al-Shirazi al-Lum'ah fi usul fiqh it doesn't have creedal problems like the ghayat al-usul fi lubbil usul by Zakari al-Ansari. So that's why I moved away from that and I came towards the Lum'ah fi usul fiqh by Shirazi. The ghayat al-usul fi lubbil usul the kitab lubbil usul originally was a summary of Jam'u al-Jawami' by Subki and then he explained it, he called it Ghayatul Usul. Okay? Inshallah, all of these books that I wrote in the board, I will be explaining them in English, inshallah ta'ala. They will come out one after the other in explanation in the English language. Bi'idhnillahi al-kareem. Luma' fi usul fiqh ba abis haqa shirazi. I said the unique thing about it is, it doesn't have big aqidah problems. Na'am la shakka, there are some issues here and there that have been mentioned by the author. But the overall amount in it, it's very good. It's a very good book. The second, the, the fourth book I believe should be looked at and studied is the Minhaj by Baydawi. The Minhaj here is by Al Baydawi. The Bay, Minhaj Al Baydawi, it's reached like a hundred shuruh, a hundred explanations, a hundred this have re, it's reached that much. Um, I don't know the, if I. Remember the best publication. I don't know if I can say it's the best publication, but one of the one of the publications I have is Darbun Hazm. That's the publication I have. But I don't know if I could say it's the best because I haven't looked and I haven't compared it. Last but not least is Jam'ul Jawami'. Jam'ul Jawami' is what? Is by Subki. This kitab, as you can see from the name, is called Jam'. And al Jawami'. What did it do? This book, the author, he brought together a hundred books of Usul al Fiqh and he summarized in there. Instead of you going and reading a hundred books of Usul al Fiqh, he read it for you and he summarized it in one book for you. Hundred books of Usul al Fiqh. Walidarika, as I told you last lesson, the Muta'akhirin. The mutaakhirin, the late comers of the scholars, they didn't go beyond and above Jam'ul Jawami'. They stuck with that. 
Because it's a summary of a hundred books. Who's got time to read a hundred books? If an author did that for you already, then alhamdulillah. Are we all together? Now, pay attention here. Jam'ul Jawami' by Subki has two famous poetries made out of it. Are we all together? The first one is... The Kawqab al-Sadr. The Kawqab al-Sadr is written by Jalal. Jalaluddin. Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. It's 1,400 and something lines. It's too much. It's too big. So many of the people they go for, the Maraqi, Maraqi Saud. I will together, brothers. The overwhelming majority of scholars, they go for the Maraqi Saud, which is a thousand lines. I will together, brothers. The Maraqi Saud, and that's the one that you would memorize. That's the one you, you'd memorize. Again, the author here is, he's a what? He's a Maliki who wrote this. But he took it from a Shafi'i. It shows you they're all upon ala tariqatil jumhur. They take from one another. They benefit from one another. Are we all together, brothers? You'd memorize this one with itqan. Once you do, wallahi, you'd benefit a lot. If you memorize this, brothers and sisters, if you memorize the Maraqis Su'ud, a thousand lines of poetry in Usul al-Fiqh, and you memorize it, and then you do all of these five, you study it with the teacher, you have mastered Usul al-Fiqh. You've combined between the two things that were needed in any science that you need to learn. And that is what? Hifd and Faham. Hifd and Faham. Any knowledge that you're trying to attain, you need memorization and you also need what? Understanding. These are the five that you understand and, these, and this is the hifz. If you don't have the courage and you don't have the strength and you don't have the aspiration to memorize a thousand lines, then go for the Nadmul Waraqat by Sharifuddin al-Imriti. The poetry from Al-Waraqat by Sharafuddin al Umriti. He said, Alhamdulillah, he led the Kat Adhara in Mal Usuri Lwara, Ashara Alali Shani Safi, for Wallahi of Tida and the one, whatever at Nas, who had Tasara, could ban cigar al Hajmi Okiwara, Wahiru could be his cigar, who masumi Bilwara Kati Lil Imam al Harami. It's good. You memorize that, it's small. You finish that, you get it over and done with. If you think I have got the aspiration, I have it in me, I am not weak like that. I am not going to let it cross me by like that. I'm going to do it and I will have make it happen. Then go for Maraq al Su'ud. Maraq al Su'ud? By Abdullah ibn Hajj al Shankiti rahimahullah. Abdullahi ibn Hajj al Shankiti rahimahullah. He's a Shankiti from Mauritania. And one of the explanations that are on this book is a sharah by Muhammad Amir al Shankiti, the author of Adwa al Bayan. He explained it. Are you with me, brothers? But his explanation, there's a slight problem in there. Within the book, in the middle of it, there's like a hundred lines that he didn't explain. Within the book, not at the beginning and not at the ending. In the middle, there's like a hundred lines of the sharah from Muhammad al-Amin Shankirti is missing from there. Are you with me, brothers? So, there are other shuruhat. The Huliya Raqi, the Huliya Taraqi, I think it's called. It's one of the best shuruh on on it but when it comes to the understanding if you've done all of these five you already understand Maraqi Su'ud Maraqi Su'ud is not to, un- to go through it with a teacher the reason why is because you've already taken the book that it was taken from and that will be an explanation for it here you can't be you can't remember this big book in a poet- poetic form you just use it straight when you need a issue to say and what you need to. Are you with me, brothers? The best sharah for Jam al Jawami' again is the sharah of Jalal Din al Mahalli. Jam al Jawami', don't busy yourself with anything or anyone else. Take the sharah of Jalal Din al Mahalli. His sharah is the one that you should rely on and that you should, uh, inshallah ta'ala, look into. 
I think that inshallah ta'ala gives us an introduction to usul al-fiqh by now. That all should be inshallah ta'ala a good insight of what usul al-fiqh is about. The benefit of usul al-fiqh is definition, where we started from and how it developed and formatted, for the formation of it. And now inshallah ta'ala we spoke about today the way to study usul al-fiqh. The mutakallimin, we said it's the jumhur, right? No, no, it's the, uh, sorry, the... Uh, yeah, the mutakallimin is the... No, the, the mutakallimin is um, jumhur, right? Jumhur is tariqa mutakallimin, right? Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, it's the second one. It's jumhur. I don't know why I said the Hanafiya. Okay, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop there for now. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan, and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruk wa atubu alayh.